Okay, uh, call the policy meeting to order at 3.30. Um, welcome, thanks for coming. Uh, this meeting is regarding the proposed changes to the current grading policy IKA. It's our understanding that these changes were developed in collaboration with district and building level leadership teams in which teachers were key members of all these teams. The policy committee values public input, but the dis decision to revert back to a 100 point grading scale is ultimately a board decision, not the policy committee. The policy committee asked to meet with current teachers of the Shaker Regional School District, especially those serving on building and district leadership teams who are part of bringing this revised policy forward. That is the purpose of this meeting, to talk with the current teachers in the district. We will not be taking public comment. So I want to start out by Silas is going to, we asked Silas to give us a very brief presentation of kind of how this is set up. Okay. Uh, let me know if you can't hear me. I'm going to try to do it without the microphone. Do that. Um, so as Michelle said, this will be brief. I just want to give a quick overview of a few things. So, uh, the timeline that got us to where we are now, the structure that we use for our different categories of learning goals, uh, and then why do we use proficiency scales? And then you get a chance to see some of those proficiency scales, uh, which teachers use for grading and to communicate uh, about the student's learning. And then, um, just very briefly, how we recognize the need for some more clarity and consistency, and, and why that um, led us to the, the policy revisions that were brought forward. Um, so here's a quick snapshot of some of the work that has happened over the last decade here at Shaker. Um, and actually, even before 2015, we had folks in Canterbury and here at the middle school already kind of um, exploring competency base and, and what we could do with that. Um, throughout the time, there's been lots of people involved, lots of time put into it. I will show you when we switch over to the target browser in, in Empower and how all of this is set up. But if you can imagine, every standard that's in our system was collaborated on by groups of teachers. Uh, vetted through building administration and myself, and then entered into a power. Um, we did kind of hit a speed bump during the pandemic. Uh, you know, we had to talk about things like safety and masks and table dividers. Uh, so not as much work was done in the end of 2020 into 2021. Uh, but picking up there, we've done lots of ongoing work with these. Everything that you're seeing here today has been updated as we go, and we're working on more updates as we speak. Uh, so I would categorize this school year as a really good opportunity for us to look at how can we be more clear in what we expect of students, and how can we be more consistent in reporting out on that. Here's the structure, and this common language was built in the 2015-16 and 2016-17 school years. Believe it or not, just coming to a consensus across a district on what these terms will be used to describe is not an easy feat. Uh, so competencies here at Shaker Regional refer to overarching categories. Those run K to 12. So the purpose there is to show the progression as you're building upon what you learned in the previous year, now we expect you to go this much farther. The standards are what we refer to as the essential learning outcomes for each content area and each grade level or course. Uh, so that's what really drives the learning and it gives us the, the chance to say this is what we expect of students. Proficiency scales go into more detail. So every standard has a proficiency scale that describes what students will know, understand, and be able to do. And then learning targets is what we refer to as the small pieces within the proficiency scales. 
Uh, so you can have a learning target that is at a level two, a learning target at a level three, and so forth. Uh, so that is what we ask of students for a given lesson, given assignment. So that's the common language. And then I'm going to take us over now to the target browser in Empower. And what we're going to see is how all those competencies, standards, proficiency scales are set up. And we'll get to uh, talk about how teachers use the proficiency scales as a communication tool about students' learning progress, and talk about how, uh, how we believe that the revised IKA policy will address some of the concerns about clarity and consistency. All right, it's tiny. Uh, so starting with math, but we've got every content area in here. Interesting. Um, so the, the drop down is not showing up on the screen, but uh, we've got 16, 17 content areas that all have the same layout. So you can see the competencies come down this left hand column. And this will help. In a different window on my other side. Uh, so there's all the content areas. Um, and you can see, actually, we can even add more. So the competencies run down the left hand column. And as you go across the competency, things build from kindergarten, first, second. And we've got the green tiles indicate early elementary, orange is upper elementary, red is middle, blue is high school. And then we have some gray that are undefined. Those are real standards for real courses. They're just kind of outside the normal progression that we'd expect a student to follow. And then the purple are honors. So any standard for an honors option course or all the standards for a course that's purely honors, such as uh, honors calculus, AP calculus, those, uh, those targets show up purple. I'm going to take us over to ELA, quickly, just to dig a little bit further into it. Uh, ELA is a little bit more straightforward in terms of the competencies really run all the way. So you can see there are reading foundational skills that once learners in first, second, sometimes third grade have mastered, we don't need targets in that competency anymore. Let me zoom in just a little bit more here might be able to catch some of these. So we're, we're talking about you know, the idea of what, what does print even mean and that big concept for a beginning reader. So we have a kindergarten standard and we have a first grade standard. Uh, and then some of the kind of more anchor standards from the Common Core really run the whole progression K to 12 in that AP English standard. Uh, so if we look at any one of these, uh, I'm just gonna pick, uh, let's look at a third grade. So this is for informational text, We're looking at text structures, analyze the logical connection between sentences and paragraphs in an informational text. And now we can see the proficiency scale. So this is defining what do we expect learners to know and be able to do to be proficient. And underlying that, what are the foundational understandings or concepts that, that they need to have. So this proficiency scale doesn't really define what the one is and gives a broad general statement for the four. That's pretty common in our proficiency scales. But we have good details for what it takes for a student to earn a two or progressing, and what it takes for those students to earn a three or proficient. So we say proficient is always the goal for any standard, but where possible, we encourage and uh, allow students to go beyond that. Uh, I'll show you a high school one just by comparison. 
So now we're in Foundations of Literature, a ninth grade English course. Analyze a variety of increasingly complex print and non-print literary and informational texts. And here, again, our proficiency scale is gonna define the criteria for each level. But this is pretty common across almost all the high school standards that there's not really a description for the one. The description for the two is pretty general. It's almost word for word what you see here for every high school standard. And it's essentially saying almost but not quite a three. And then for the four, it's the same. We have common language across almost every high school standard saying you did what was required for proficient and you went above and beyond that. So that's where it comes in that we could be clearer and we could be more consistent in how we award different score levels if we had more robust descriptions for the level two when you're learning those foundational concepts and for the four when you're applying them in, in a new context. Uh, so in order to do that, we did a lot of talking with each building's leadership team and feedback out to grade level teams or department teams in the back, um, trying to build what we thought would be the best way to align all our scales so that they are clear and consistent, and that being based on the depth of knowledge or learning taxonomy. So we can say there are certain complex reasoning skills at each level of proficiency, and starting from proficient and working both down and up we can describe what it is that a student would know, understand, and be able to do for each of those levels. So that's it. Uh, all I really wanted to show you is just kind of how it's set up, all that's in there, and uh, you know, express gratitude for, for the amount of work that, uh, that has gone into building what we have. Thank you. So we appreciate the teachers, um, those of you teachers coming, um, so we really want to hear from you um, in terms of um, how did anyone, any of the teachers want to comment if they know, how did we arrive in your role in the updated version of this policy? So like what was the teacher's role in the, this updated version? Well, I was on the district team, uh, so I would go to those meetings, we'd be working on this, I would go back to our uh, faculty council meetings, explain what we're working on, show what we're working on, and then the different departments, or at least I can speak for the English department, I'd bring it back to them and kind of talk about where we're at or suggestions. That Um, I'm on the district support team as well, and we talked as a, um, a group of those of us that are on the leadership team about the different proficiency scales. We had a full staff meeting at CES where we talked with the teachers about what, were, what was happening, what we were discussing. We had individual grade level um, and you know, up and down grade levels, the person above and below us, to go through that information as well. Um, teachers all had the opportunity to um, give us personal feedback or also in a large group setting as well too. So I feel like all the teachers in our building have had a chance to have their say in whatever way they wanted to um, to express their, their views on that. Thanks. Hi, I'm Dave McDonald and uh, I'm a teacher at the high school <clears throat> and I felt as though we as a math team had a, a lot of input. Uh, Craig, our fearless leader, I thought did a great job in uh, bringing information to us, collecting information to us, getting opinions, and I felt that we were able to have uh, input into you know what we're talking about today. So I, I felt that I was heard, and I, I think that other people in the department, though not necessarily everybody agreed about everything, but I think everybody had an opportunity in our department to express their uh, opinion. Agree, Craig? Yes. The high school had started to, the faculty council started talking about 
restructuring things in the summer. Uh, with that. And then when we started school, we brought in the full faculty. Um, there was a document that everybody had the opportunity to comment on. And um, we worked during some of our faculty meetings to discuss some of it. Or something. And then in our department meetings, as was described, we continued to work on. So uh, high school certainly had adequate opportunity to voice them. While that's true, I find that the comments that were made to ask for clarification on the policy were resolved, but never really modified. And I found that I think that the document itself, when every time in a faculty department meeting or a faculty meeting when we ask questions for clarification on some of the terminology, we always, well, I, I won't speak for everybody, I always got that's a good question, we'll talk about it, but nothing was ever clarified or resolved. And I still have questions with the way that it sets terminology-wise now. Um, it's not very clear. And I've been in education for 40 years plus, and I just find either as a parent, as a teacher, um, it just doesn't really seem as clear as we're making it out to sound. A lot of us made on it were resolved so it didn't really have a resolution there was no that's good we'll incorporate this there was a in set the document, in yeah. the document. So you mean resolved, resolved, like you google right. whatever you click it and it goes away right right so but you wouldn't know what you're saying is you had you would ask for clarification but they were that your view is that the comments were resolved but you didn't have a reason Except for one set of comments that you can still see on the document, offering more explanation of things, but nothing really changing it. Okay. Um, and we also, there's certain people, I don't know who else might want to speak today, but we also took statements from other people that didn't feel comfortable uh, talking. So there's a couple of us that have documents to read from other people, if anybody else wants to speak first. to. Um, are they teachers at the school? Teachers. They also need to be identified. So I think that they were afraid of that because they're not tenured yet. Oh. So. Um, well. <laughs> I could. I'll claim one of them because I agree well, with what's. Said, and is but. it related? Let me. I'm not saying we can't get it but is it related to how we arrived at the updated version of this policy I just want to make sure it fits the question it does fit the question because it all refers to one through four um, I think there's two issues one is the one through four and the other is the grading platform and one of them speaks to both so my question is does it speak to the question we're asking is okay Right no, now. no, I know. Right now, <laughs> yes, we are talking about IPA, so that's good. But um, does it relate to the question at hand, which was checking the question? How did we arrive at the updated version of this policy? Oh, yeah. Okay. Kim. All right, so my name is Kimberly Brace. I teach grade three at Canterbury. I actually co share um, the district support team. Kim week is doing the first half of it in the fall and then I came on the spring. So there was lots of communication between the two of us because I was going to hop on in the spring. I needed to know what the background information was, which is way back in the fall when this started being talked about. But Kim and I go way back to before 2015 with the whole beginning of it, with the design teams and the traveling out west. Where did you go? Colorado? <laughs> Um, to actually look at these programs and see how can we bring some of those important concepts back to our school. We did lots of different things and tried lots of different ways. Um, and I think we're almost finally there, where we really feel really confident and comfortable with what we're doing and how we're assessing and how we're grading. 
but we've had some shifts since COVID. Um, and so we have some new faculty that has now joined us that we're retraining and, and helping bring up to, up to speed. But there was lots of communication. Um, I really felt like the district team listened because the original, or one of the drafts, I should say, that we started with, Canterbury was not comfortable with the scale that was proposed. It was brought back to them, feedback was given. I brought the feedback back and said, we can't support that scale, which was originally the one through four for um, elementary. We really felt confident with the one through three for many reasons that were discussed at that meeting. And so that, in my opinion, has brought us to where we are today, which answers your question. Yes. Hi, I'm Natalie, I'm a science teacher. I'm also, I've only been here two years, but I am on the faculty council at the school. And I have a comment that is not just me, but it's, it's by the science department, because we got together in our PWT and talked about what we might want to bring forward in this meeting. Um, so I can give you the names of the other science teachers, but no, I, yeah. it makes sense. So um, what they, what we wanted to discuss was the fact that in terms of teaching and learning, and again, I've only been here two years, but um, what some people feel like is that it has never been better by going through this process of aligning our curriculum and having everybody in the science department teaching to the same standards with the same proficiency scales. So there's, there's equity across everyone that's teaching physical science, which is five physical science teachers, we know they're all going to be delivering the same content. They might not do it the same way. So that is a, that's been a good part of this work and how we all feel like that was the most important part of the work was actually aligning our curriculum and thinking about what we teach and how we teach it. But when not necessarily as clear on that assessment piece about how the clarity of what a four is and what a three is and how we probably still need to do some some work with that but that the process that we've gone through in terms of how we teach it has made people we feel like in our building much better teachers I think similar to what Sharon said, I feel like um, for some, for some, maybe for some departments, um, the language in this every time it came up, we would question it, and we are fighting in our department, French teacher, world language, art, music. You know, we do skills and. For us, especially as language teachers, to every time we see this language on the new IK policy, we question that because in my French one or two or three class, they cannot do these, the student independently extends and transfers sophisticated concepts and skills to authentic novel context. I would be grading them if I were to use this. French one would be going for a one. They can only learn words. So we've had a lot of discussions with this, but it, it's still very clear to a lot of us as to how we would actually grade for this. It was already difficult enough. So just not fitting your context. So right. Yeah. So I'm Brian McNabb. Um, going way back, we, the schools received different types of training. Like the high school, for example, did Freshman Academy, which was a select group of people, and most of them are not here anymore. So when the process started, different schools were given different learning opportunities to the teachers, where I think some of the assessment part that I think people have brought up has always been kind of one of the bigger issues, is I don't think it was as well thought out at the high school level as it was at other levels. Or it's that easy to implement. And that was the, that's before any of this. Yeah. What it led up to it. Yeah. 
questions. Do you feel that this, this is to anyone, um, do you feel that this updated IKA policy provides a foundation from which to build additional grading expectations? Because this is the foundation and then each building would develop, my understanding is grading expectations, so like what goes into the grade? Chair. Sharon Hampton, the high school. I think as Silas laid out in Empower, the proficiency scales that we have are pretty clear on what's expected um, for students. I think it's a different format than what the IKA, I don't think that that's our foundation. At least in my mind, it does not seem, I don't know, as it's not as coherent as what's in the proficiency scales. And the proficiency scales, that's easy enough to understand. I don't think the IKA policy is. And then the one that was done 15 years ago, or whatever it was, in 2000, not 15, 10 years ago in 2015, um, that was broad enough that you could almost give that interpretation. But I don't think that that's what we need. I think we need a little bit of clarity. I don't want to say that everybody has to do the same IKA scale in that one through four. I don't think it's a one size fits all. I do like how the proficiency scales are a little bit more clear to that. Do I think parents and hence probably some teachers may not, it's like a curriculum guide. And I've been through a lot of curriculum changes over the years. You have it, you know what you're supposed to be doing, but it sits on a shelf. Those sit in a document. And yeah, we access them every time we go to build and look at our bodies of evidence to make a claim about what a student's thing is. That's more clear to me than what the IKA policy is. Greg Wilkins, uh, high school uh, I, The answer to your question, I would say is yes. I think it does provide uh, open enough foundation that allows us to then build more specific efficiency scales upon that give that greater detail. To, to create something that's going to work district-wide, uh, I think it does offer the foundation. Um, so I, mean, it'll, like, I, I don't think that all the proficiency scales that are housed in that target browser are clear because they are not connected to like a Google Docs. So if I were to change something, next year maybe I want to teach something a little differently or I want to ask kids to provide me with a different piece of evidence, that target browser and the efficiency scales that are currently in there have not undergone any change in many, many years and don't reflect what is currently happening, certainly in my classroom. I don't have access to change anything that's in there. Do you think IKA forms the basis or a foundation for us to build upon, or is that separate? I, I guess speaking from the middle school standpoint, um, a long, long time ago, the middle school was the first school to like, all right, this is this is what we're doing, and I'll give Mr. Cope a lot of credit with that. Um, and we just did it, and we we've, we've been using the one through four for a very long time. Um, and from our perspective, the changes in the language aren't terribly drastic from the world that we've been living in and teaching. Others? I think I'm still like looking at this, sorry, uh, the, the titles, the transferring, the complex reasoning, proficient, foundational, it's the descriptions that get me every time. And I look at this, 
not looking at the elementary one. I think that you know, they know what they're doing, but for five through 12, and I just think of a fifth grader, independently, every single one is, you know, demonstrates the ability to apply complex reasoning skills and utilize some of the ability to extend concepts to authentic novel context. I just have a really hard time. I, I can't see this for high schoolers, not in, in another language, but I even see it really hard for other subjects and for, you know, a 10 year old. I mean, just the description part for me is, I just can't get over it. <laughs> it's big. Big words. Anyone else? Other questions? Uh, so, what um, what would be the biggest the biggest stru uh, struggles in regards to the implementation um, of this? And it can be either instructional or report uh, because I think there's I think we've identified there's a there seems to be a big difference between uh, the acceptance of of the competency end of things, not necessarily on the reporting end of things. So um, I'd like to, to hear people's opinion on either. Yeah, I think consistency across the board is impossible as far as allocating threes and fours for certain standards or certain assignments. Um, it's so subjective and even we've talked to ourselves in circles for how yes. long years years even this year like just this school year the amount of times we've had the conversation about what a three is and what a four is and we've talked it dead and we still have no clarification so, so can i interrupt you for a yeah. second um so are you talking about the two different teachers teaching the same class? Are you talking about uh, I, individual students? I uh, think we have streamlined, well, I, I hope we've streamlined two teachers teaching the same class, but that was, that definitely was a situation um, last school year and possibly at the beginning of this school year where we did have some content that was being taught by different people and they had completely different expectations of what a three is and what a four is. So I, I think we still have some teachers that are refusing to give fours for certain assignments um, and just the level of understanding for what a three is and what a four is. It seems impossible to be able to streamline and make it consistent across the board because even teachers' expectations are different. Like, Natalie's expectations could be completely different than another teacher that's teaching the same content. Um, and even though we have those proficiency scales, the way that a child demonstrates that knowledge could be starkly different just based on their academic profile. Like, if you're looking at your fours and you're expecting, everyone cares about their GPA in the high school. Well, GPA is a big deal with this right now. And my son, who doesn't go to this district at all, but um, is on the spectrum, has ADHD and intense anxiety. If he were to look at, not to look at this, but if he were expected to be able to perform at a level four, he would have a complete panic attack, even though like, he would know that would be expected. But any child whose parents aren't educated or whose parents don't value education who are neurodivergent in any way, shape, or form, struggle with anxiety, they're not going to be able to reach those four levels without support, which does not create a level playing field and, in my opinion, is discriminatory. Any other struggles? So, uh, Craig Wolf, again. Um, I think uh, the one big struggle will be getting in the high school will be adapting our proficiency scales to have, include 
the lower levels, like Silas's presentation in San High School basically has the three column. So adopting this policy and having the time to re-examine all of those proficiency scales and rework them to fit the policy will be a challenge. Um, getting everybody on board is going to be a challenge with accepting what it, what does define a four, what does define a three. Um, it, it's it's going to take time. It's not anything that's going to we'll be able to snap our fingers and it'll be solved. Um, but I think that's why I think the, the broad nature of the, the document not being so specific allows us to build upon that. Um, and I think, you know, I look at it that the expectation is for students to earn three. The expectation is not for students to earn four. That but four, that affects their GPA. That four is going above and beyond. And so that could be, you know, maybe there's a different way of Structuring it, you know, one idea would, would be making uh, you know, the three or four and then doing a five point scale. You know, something larger like that so that then if you're reporting a GPA up to a three, you know, up to a four, more in line with what um, society sees as, as four. Because you know, they're equating four with you know, A. Um, you know, and, uh, and they're not the same thing. They're two entirely different scales. So you know, we can't equate it that way. Sharon Hampton again. Um, I think part of this too, the bigger struggle will be with colleges and for our students who are applying for colleges and scholarships. I think they have been told that a college will look at their application, look at our profile. I know when I was a college admissions, I didn't look at the profiles, that wasn't my job. But I don't think they look at them as closely, perhaps, as students believe or parents believe they are. And if a student gets really good grades, GPA really shouldn't matter. It's one of the factors. They'll look at all of these different things, but I think the big struggle will be it's, it was tried. Some schools tried it. They backed out. I think the struggle will be convincing colleges that these kids do merit scholarship and admissions based on this system that they're not familiar with. So I will say, um, I think we would want more data to support, to, I, I would like some data around that and I'm saying that, I'll personally disclose that some of you know, my son was awarded a four-year Navy ROTC scholarship and a four-year Army ROTC scholarship. His GPA is not, like, because the school profile goes with it, and I've not, you know, he's gotten into some amazing universities that, so I'm just saying, I, I don't disagree that there's an issue. I just wanna say, I'm using that as one example, that we have to make sure when we are looking, because mine's one example, so that that's not the whole thing either. But I think we need some data around that, and I know Michael collected some data for us by calling some schools. Um, so I just, I just want to, I want to hesitate, I, I'm asking us to pause before we make broad statements about whether schools, colleges, universities, what they're looking at. Um, the scholarships he received are very competitive. Only 1,200 Army and only 1,000 Navy. So I'm just using that as an example and his GPA is not, 4.2 or 3.9 even. So I just want to make sure we're based on data. So that's that's all. Not to take us fully down a different road. But. Um, I think one, one struggle I, at the high school, probably the middle school too, is we all teach a different subject. And um, we're having a really hard time. Some of us are skill-based, some of us are content-based, and fitting it all into this system has been a huge struggle. So if somebody in another department can do these things, it doesn't mean that we all can do these things. I think that's something that's really hard for us. In terms of consistency? Yes. And that's the question. Yeah. And also, you know, the goal is not a four, the goal is a three, but you know, we have this, this huge issue with um, 
GPA, with kids who really watched you well, not doing it well. Um, and another thing is um, that I find that's tough with this is just those small numbers between failing and proficient. Consistency, buy-in, <coughs> time to re-examine proficiency scale. You know, 60 students, and then you only see them for one class a day. And, you know, it's a lot for us to, to look at all this evidence. We're supposed to be looking at the linear trend and making a claim and all of that kind of stuff. And we this with a big group of students, and we only see them for one class a day. It's not like that. You know, elementary school and they have them the whole day and they really are getting to know what these students can really do. Um, another, it does really sort of echo what other people have said that <coughs> in the science department is the accessibility of a fall and um, making sure that every every student has the opportunity to set that in the fall and just wanting the opportunity to get everyone try and get everyone on the same page to make it more consistent throughout the school throughout the district on the on what the fault is. Would now be an okay time to talk about like you has mentioned something about the reporting out as they don't struggle and they are somewhat connected. Sure yeah, yeah e e either or because uh, yeah. like I said I, I think it, it, there's two paths uh, but if we're gonna if we're gonna talk about struggles I, I think we need to talk about you know both sides of the coin on that. Yeah. Um, so I have, a, I have a massive issue with how we report how our students are doing out, and I, I think it's been so, how, how, how we report out. On oh, report out. Okay. Um, and so when we have this four-point grading scale, which is unlike what parents went through when they went to school and whatnot, Empowered does not allow us to easily communicate with home on the journey of how a student got a three, or how a student got a two. Um, there is a lot of day-to-day -day work that goes on in the classroom, and that's by what we're, the world that we're in. It's formative work, it's ungraded, but essentially it is, they are the stepping stones, that body of evidence to what's gonna get them that three, but Empower doesn't allow us to do that, that out. And so I do feel as though parents are wondering, how are things going? And I would love to be able to be more communicative, but I see 86 students a day, and Empower is just not working as far as that goes. And so I think that's something that is contributing to a lack of understanding of how the grading system works. <coughs> I've been working a lot on on my own time with, with Alma and some of the things that Alma can do that Empower cannot is out of this world. Our understanding of the district is exploring Alma and moving away from Empower. I think that will help a lot. We, we want parents to be involved. We want parents to talk to their kids at home about what's happening in school. Tell me about this assignment that I can look at on my phone because Alma has the ability to do that. Oh, tell me about this thing that was just put in. Oh, I noticed that you have something missing. And to be able to start having those conversations with their children and for all of us to be more collaborative. Right now it feels like I'm the keeper of all the information, but it's hard for me to get that out to the people who need it and deserve it. I agree with you on Empower and Brian McNabb. Just the fact that we've used it for this long period of time, and when I, I teach seniors and I ask them, you know, can they tell me certain things about the grade or figure things out without my assistance, they are done. And that's not everyone, but it's a good shock. I 
Any other struggles? Thank you. I have an appointment. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, uh, so I'm kind of curious what professional development. Um, there's probably a broad range of faculty here from uh, faculty within their first uh, three, three or four years uh, to veteran. Um, if we go back to 2015-ish, um, what professional development has the staff had um, to help make this successful? We've had quite a bit of training 10 to 15 years ago. When this first started coming about, um, and I mean, this being working towards proficiency skills and that kind of stuff. I don't think a lot of professional development was devoted to empower. We had some Silas comes and helps us as needed, but I also think it's been difficult for him to, like if I make a mistake, if I submit too early, then it causes more work for him to then reverse all of that to fix something. So as far as the professional development goes, we developed the proficiency scales, we gave them to him to do, but as far as the IK kind of stuff, the one through four scale, we talked about it, but I, it was very philosophical, theoretical. It was not as practical when it came down to it. Um, and that was 15 years ago. Silas has done a nice job trying to keep things going, but we've got this really inconsistent training on this, going all the way back to like 2002, 2003. Mm -hmm. And it depends who the administration is and how supportive they are with what we've ended up getting over time. And then something will change. Like even if we get going, usually there's a new principal a couple times, that sort of thing, or it's gotten kind of and with new staff and everything in turnover, it gets a little bit consistent in terms of people's understanding. There was definitely a switch, I'm not, not going to put a year on it, where we would be hiring people and one of the questions was, tell us what you know about standard-based grading or competency-based grading. And if they were recent college graduates, they could tell you all about it because that has been the change in terms of becoming a teacher and what they're getting taught to them in college. So there's kind of this gap of like, I learned competency-based grading in college versus I didn't. And so for those of us who didn't, you know, we were around for this is how you write a proficiency scale. And this is, this is what you need a student to be able to show you in order to get a three. I'd say those are the two camps, those of us who learned it in college and those of us who were taught it while we were here teaching. Okay. Carrots and I, I definitely can avoid the very beginning of a huge mess like 11 years now. So it was at the beginning of the proficiency scale development. If you're going to ask what PB, not that I really want to boast, Aaron, but <laughs> incredible, every PLC for multiple years was devoted to developing these stands within content areas, then coming back to BLTs and, and talking about, I mean, what should three look like or four? I feel like the middle school, that was a lot of PLC. Silas did come in and show us the standards, and I will say I agree, man, that the one drawback is Silas is the keeper of the data as far as standards, and we can't alter it if we change our what we deliver for instruction but definitely he came in and how do I put that evidence in it's really sad because we put a lot of time and put you know, level two evidence into it and I don't think most parents can easily access it so they're not seeing what is I mean so what is leading your child to that three impossible four in there but I feel like the middle school current kids be able to, I mean, we spent a lot of PLC time, a lot of PD time to develop those. Okay. I'll speak on behalf of Canterbury. Um, 
Ooh. So we have had a ton, um, and we spent one, oh, preface this way, we're a small school. So there's a lot of us that wear triple hats, and a lot of times we have to teach each other. Um, so when Terry Minot went from te teaching in our building to then becoming that instructional coach, we had an automatic trust established, um, and a lot of times she would come back and teach us about Empower and how to get in there and how to put the evidence and how what the proficiency skills were. We were allowed to go to the MCCL um, with B. And we spent a lot of time with B. A lot of us got to know her personally. And a lot of time going to Portland to those um, showcases. Some of us even showcased at the, that conference. Um, so there was a lot of PD. Then COVID hit. We had a change in administration. We have a switch that's happening, and I think part of what we were headed towards, it kind of stopped a little bit so we could just manage what was happening, and now it needs to start back up. Silas did a great job pulling all the third grade teachers um, together to work on common assessments because, again, the expectation of one teacher may be different than another teacher, but if you have those common district assessments for each of those standards to go with those scales, then everyone's playing on the same field. But that takes time. And we've only gotten through math and part of BLA. So we still have more work to do. Yeah. And I'll yeah. piggyback on what Kim was saying as well too. Um, when In those days when Terry was just starting and working with us, we did a lot of parent education as well. So there was a team of us in third, fourth, and fifth grade, and we would have, we called them compass conversations. We invited parents in, we invited students to talk and say what they were doing as well. So there was a lot of education, and there were like three or four years where there was a lot of student involvement, a lot of parent involvement. So that group of students and that group of parents knew all about the proficiency scales, all about the learning targets, all about how to go from one to the next and then you know that group of students aged out came up to the middle school we get new students and just over time again we get the you know, precursor to COVID and all of that we're all in survival mode so this year you know this last couple of years groups of parents it's different because they aren't as aware as you know those that first group of parents that came through so I think a lot of what will help us is you know, educating this group of parents that we have currently and really spending the time and having those, those more workshop kind of things that, to get them um, on board with that as well. Because when the kids know and can explain, and when you have elementary age children that can explain what they're doing and how they can get a two and how they can get a three mm -hmm. and the difference between those, that's very powerful. Um, and just also adding what Kim was saying through the third grade, kindergarten has done a lot of work with Silas this year as well in working on our um, proficiency scales and common assessments. And it's really wonderful for us to be able to have both buildings working together because it is a struggle to figure out, well, how do I assess this? And what does that look like for me? And we're trying to build that commonality across um, both elementary buildings. And that's been very successful. Wilkins. Um, I came on in 19. 20, um, just before COVID. Uh, and, and 20. 20. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, this is 20 years. years. <laughs> <laughs> you look great. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and in that time, you know, I mean, well, you know, it's it's hard to get a lot of professional development in on this. It's just not much time for us to do it. And what I've seen that we have done has been more collaborative thing. Um, building, you know, building common assessments is a great thing. Um, we've talked about it some, and we've got the, you know, this much that we've been able to try to do that. Um, having been in other districts, they were, I was there where they brought in professionals from outside to help. And I think that that might be something that would benefit us having to, this distinction between three and four and trying to decide what's what, um, rather than having it be our administration trying to tell our faculty and our faculty getting angry with our administration. You know, if, if it's somebody else that is very skilled and, and knowledgeable that can help the way that they, like these college students uh, might be learning, you know, something that that way, that and, and turnover is difficult though. <laughs> you go and train people and you know, three years later it's you know, gone. So it, it almost needs to be a very ongoing thing or we need to someone in-house that can handle training people on 
getting up to speed until this is a more widely accepted uh, practice. Brian McNabb, if we were to get outside people, they have to understand the system that we're actually using and not come in with different ideas, which makes it very inconsistent when you hear that. And then you try to change everything based off of someone said and it doesn't really fit what we're doing. I agree with that a lot. It can't be somebody's notion of what we should be doing. Like, it can't be main cohort for customized learning. I'm sorry, it just should not be. It needs to be somebody who understands what we want to deliver and would help us do that. We, we, you know, Sharon and I actually started doing this years before the rest of the school did it because for language it made sense to have this. We have, you know, proficiency levels for language already and we, you know, used our this one to four scale but it wasn't really until we actually did a switch to grading in the one to four scale that got more complicated for us and we, I don't feel like we ever really had any professional development as to how to actually grade in our content with a one to four scale fairly. Um, proficiency scales is, is not only like writing them, but it's super helpful. It's helped our curriculum. We know what we're teaching. It's the grading and reporting part that we still have a huge problem with in the high school um, because we still don't understand it. And we've been working on this for years. And this has been every PD day, every faculty meeting, we talk about this, we go through it, and it's a, it's a lot. And to, to hear, like, oh, let's bring in somebody else, or let's keep working on this, it's like, like when, when do we get to work on teaching, not grading and reporting? It, it doesn't sound like there's any one single point of failure. It sounds like there's a lot of communication and education that needs to happen. Does that sound accurate? I mean, this is a very broad question. Does anybody have any idea or any, any ideas on how we might be able to do something like that? I mean, beyond what you guys are doing, obviously you have very strong relationships with the other teachers that you're working with in your in your subjects and your schools and everything, but it, it seems like maybe things differ even from school to school. Um, I would love if any of you had any 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 ideas on what we might be able to do to, to alter that, to, to help with that, to help kind of the consistency. I, I understand that that's a very loaded question and that nobody's going to have anything immediately. But. Do we have to be doing the same thing at three different schools? We never did before. We had elementary. It's very different from high school. Should their grading and reporting be the same as ours? Already we're looking at IK, which is not the same. K through 4 is 1 to 3 and 5 through 12 is, is 1 to 4. So, I, I mean, is do we have to have the same system for elementary versus middle and high school? I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer to that either, but again, no, I think I've, I've written down a question. Oh, right. <laughs> Great <laughs> question. <laughs> well, but I mean, but that this is this is what it we're going like to have to discuss. It sounds like it's working for CES. I don't know about BES, but it, it's it worked. Yeah. My kids, you know, had this when they were in school, so it worked great for elementary. You know, it's. It's not that different than way back. Then way back, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, we're having a bigger, it's getting harder as we go on. Harder in middle school and even harder in high school. So you're saying it, it gets harder in middle school and then doubles so in the high school to work within, yeah, with, with, within current, current policy? Yes. Okay. Sure. The two testimonials that I have, and I'm just going to speak to it since I don't have these names. I also agree with what I have in my hands that I think uh, zero to, well, not zero, but 
I guess, zero to 100 scale would be better in that it allows more understanding, a greater depth of range for grading. It's something parents know, it's something colleges use, um, something that some of us grew up with rather than this one through four. One through four is too limiting, so if you're asking for a recommendation, um, I would like to move zero to 100 and go back, and then later we can discuss what's failing, whether it's 60 or 70, but. Right. Thank you. Any other question? Consistency. Communication and education. Yes. Communication, education, consistency. So I'm kind of curious, um, and we can do a we can do a raise of hands. I have basically there's three three questions that are kind of the same the same thing, but I'm differentiating out on who it applies to. Um, if you can, so who who among you think that you have a strong understanding of competencies when it, applying it to both instructional, uh, I guess, instructional delivery and reporting. Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, thank, no, thank you. So, why, so why don't we just go on on the instruction? So, a strong understanding of competencies on, on instruction, and then report. Um, how about students? Do students have a strong understanding of competencies on the instructional end of things? Your your opinion. Yeah. How, how, how about how about on the reporting? Yeah. I think it's Gloria. Kind of yeah. No, you can interrupt, teach please. First grade at BES. Yep. I think it's different at our like for first graders because we actually build the proficiency scale with them so that they can understand it. And I would agree with you that when it first kind of came out back in 2015, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> we did a lot more parent things, so I think parents and students understood it a lot more. Um, and that perhaps we should get back to like having those things for parents well so you just led me to, to the last question of is how many of you think that parents have an understanding of the instructional end of competencies and then on the reporting end of things as well so big goose egg on parents on both from both ends. My thought is that if we change our reporting, that's probably not going to fix everything, but it's a step at least in the right direction. You mean our system? Yes. Yeah. Sharing more information with parents. I think it's a, it's a good first step. Because right now they get like a power's updated when the final grade for that standard goes in and there's there's nothing in the lead up to that and sometimes you could spend weeks on one standard on annual in high school um, I find a majority of my parents want to know is my institute passing and what do they owe and a power won't do either of those yeah. It's very frustrating yeah. for us, for them, for the students. Well, parents don't even want to know if their kids are doing well. They want to know if they're passing, which is such a low bar in my mind. But they can't even find that out. No. You're all sharing it, so thank you. This has been incredibly informative, so definitely thank you. 
All right. So we have to decide what we, three of us, are doing. We're done. I mean, we want you to stay. Like, How about we stay? Listen to us talk. You know. um, don't feel like you have to. Um, okay. <laughs> I know. So I just gonna say it's gonna come off. It is. Um we have to decide. Well, we Edgar, you have on good side. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. You can come up. Well, you can. Um. Yeah. So I. I mean, I don't feel like we can. I mean, we can bring everything in terms of what we've heard and what we've collected. Exactly, and we're happy to take this information that we've learned today and previously back to the board, but I am not comfortable making this decision without the entirety of the board. I agree. So, I think we need to have a larger discussion. We won't bring it to the board. So bring, it, bring the current policy to the board for a first reading, or? I, I think that might be how we have to do it. Is that how we have to do it? Well, so that's that coming out of the blessing of the policy committee. Well, I don't. Is that what it means? If it's going to go to the full board for reading, that means it comes out of. Yeah, that's, out of that policy. tends to be the practice. I mean, if it comes out of policy committee, then policy is vetted well enough that they're comfortable bringing it to the full board for the first reading. Well, I don't know that I can say that exactly because for me, this is one piece of a larger package that it in there we're missing the other piece of the package, which I've talked about before. Like this forms the foundation, but then what does reporting look like and how would the concerns actually be addressed? Because right. um, the concerns we heard from students and even with uh, the teachers here today don't like this policy is not the one that would solve everything. It's the potentially a stepping stone from which to build. So I guess my question is, can we bring this to the board? Okay, I understand that's what we typically do, but can't we just bring it to the board? Sure. And in the committee, you could put it under an agenda item under policy committee. For discussion. And then you could give an update for discussion yeah, as to so, where the community right. is at this point, and just give it as an update. Because I don't know that I'm ready to give this my, like, yep, we're good, I'm I'm not there yet. But I also just don't think that the three of us alone can make this decision. I'm just trying to think out a format of an agenda. Right. So we would just put internal policy committee, and then have it as an update on discussion with teachers, and update where you are with the policy, or just update. Um, I think update the discussion. Update the discussion, yeah. Because yeah. I, I would like to know everybody together, like, what what do they want to do? Like, do we want more input? Do we, like, do we want a school policies that go with this? I'm making this up. I have no idea. But, like, there's only three of us. And this is obviously getting a lot of attention, as it should. Um, but the three of us are not the board. We are just the policy committee. And I am, for something of this magnitude, I would really like to have the other board members weigh in. We so, have the direction of the entire Exactly. So our, that'll be go on the May 10th, I think it is. is our May 10th agenda, full board, under internal policy committee update and discussion. Correct, yes. So we can get some additional, what do you want to do? Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. 
Because otherwise, this is just going to go back. First reading, get kicked back. First reading, get kicked back. Right. Like we want. Um, I think it's easier if we just have the full board discussion now, and we can maybe cut out some of those first readings and kickbacks. Sounds good. Okay. Do that. Anything else? Okay. The meeting adjourned at four forty.